I think I'm playing chess. I see a king, I'm at his neck. I'm three steps ahead of every move, now that's a check. Yes, they want to know my secret. It's because I never slept. All my nightmares of me at 40, life's a wreck. Uh, what is up, everybody? For another bit here with the UV. <laughs> this is some funny shit. And we're going with this one. I did that last time. <laughs> But this fucking guy gave me the wrong name. <laughs> Look at it. It was I, so funny. Dude, I, 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 thought, I thought it was Colin. I've mispronounced Colin. names all the time. <laughs> oh, shit. We are joined today with, number one, my co-host, Alan Kantarevich. We got Billy Beach in the building and Vince. Dude, I'm so happy to have you here. I'm happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you here. So it's funny because you were like, oh, you're kind of surprised with the studio. I heard you. Yeah. You walked in. Dude, we put this thing together in six days. I'm a nerd for this kind of shit. And can I cuss? I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm oh, a nerd yeah. for this kind of shit. And dude, this is a gorgeous setup. And I've I am a little jealous because I've had mine for many years yeah. and never this cool. Yeah. <laughs> dude, six fucking days. Me and Daniel started putting this thing together. My wife came in to help me finish the job. We built this desk from scratch. That's dope. We were looking at desks and furniture, and I'm like, dude, these broadcasting desk the ones that are this size are like seven grand with the tv oh no, it's expensive too. and i'm like all right i'm gonna put one together myself this thing cost me 700 bucks Beautiful. total with the tv it. with yep. the tv i love all the soundproofing and everything yeah. this whole room is built i'm saying well, i might have to borrow it sometime <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, come on in <laughs> the lights change everything um but no dude we're happy to have you here so if you guys don't know vince vince is uh one of the actors uh gilly on the mayans on fx yeah and uh Hulu, which is badass. It's on Hulu. Yeah, it's on FX and Hulu. Yeah. 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 So, so here, dude, funny story. Last night I was like, I got to get caught up on these episodes because I used to watch Sons of Anarchy and uh, I was a big fan of some of the stuff that the producer has done in the past. And uh, when I was like, uh, I got to throw this damn phone down here. When I was um, uh, trying to get set up, I, I, I had lost my credit card. And I didn't update. <laughs> I didn't update Hulu, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, but here, here's the funny thing. I was loving it because I was getting notifications constantly from America First. And it's like, denied charge, denied charge. Because these companies like from Apple iTunes and all this yeah, shit. Yeah, so you find all the subscriptions all you, yeah, you forgot about. Yeah, 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 I'm getting all these charges. And I'm like, yes. Like, <laughs> bro, they can't get to me anymore. They can't get to me no more. I might need to do that. <laughs> yeah. But I forgot to, to, to update my card on Hulu. Yeah. And so I was trying to update it last night. But I couldn't get into iTunes, and I, bro, I was so pissed. It was like eleven o'clock at night, and I'm like, "How the fuck am I gonna get caught up on this season? <laughs> I gotta, I gotta, I gotta jump on the podcast tomorrow." And Is this so, like last weekend when we went to the club and you didn't have your ID? <laughs> oh yeah, bro. I'm hell the door guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm that guy. I forget everything. I lose yeah, everything, bro. Yeah. Oh. This guy's over here like, don't you see this guy? He's a fucking celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is the producer of the show. This fucking air is great. Let him in. <laughs> it was so funny. And then and then just so happens, one of my boys walks by and was like, oh, shit, look, it's Fernando the Celebrity. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Use yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Do you hear him? Hear him? I'm you good for him? your image. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, it was, it was, it was hilarious. Um, but no, dude, I'm happy to have you here. Really want to get uh, uh, a background on your story, on you, uh, your life. I heard a little bit of it from that uh, video I shared with you, actually, mm -hmm. um, that FX did with you, where you talked about your previous life with the yeah. military, with the Border Patrol. And I was like, holy shit, this guy's got a badass story. And then Billy filled me in on some of the entrepreneurship that you do, yeah. all the companies you've started. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about all that stuff. Yeah, man, let's do so, it. I'm ready. So, so first of all, where are you from, bro? How'd you uh, come here to Utah? Yeah, originally from Los Angeles, California. Um, Played some college baseball, joined the military, and then after the military, didn't want to raise my kids in L.A. I grew up in the gang areas, right, where, which is very prevalent at the time, and I was like, I don't want my kids to be associated with that or be around it as much as I was. And so we moved to Arizona. I got a job as a corrections officer, transitioned into the Border Patrol. And then in the Border Patrol time frame, I started doing YouTube and getting into the entertainment scene. And we'll, but we'll slow down later, yeah. but just fast yeah. forward to... I landed a show for the History Channel. Uh, I pitched it to a producer, and then we pitched it to History, and we got it. It was called Brothers in Arms. Yep, I saw it. Yeah, that. man. We filmed I five episodes, it. and they shut it down because <laughs> oh, because man. the uh, the gun conversation was was a little edgy at the time, and it still is. It's an edgy, edgy you know, in the Hollywood space. Yeah. You know, network television is paid for by the sponsors, and the sponsors are the people that are in commercials, and those commercials don't want to be supporting anything gun related because yeah. it could look bad against them. And I understand the concept. And so uh, they just had a very terrible active shooter situation in, in, in Vegas at the time and then Florida. And so we were kind of in the middle of that and it was just timing. Right. So, so it shut down the show and, 
from there, we decided to stay here. You know, it was a, it's the best place in my opinion for raising my kids. It was kind of yeah. the best kept secret. Yep. I tell yep. everyone, if you're not from here, stay away. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where we met. Yeah. Right? And we that, met the day you guys blew up a house. Yeah, exactly. You're, I, you're I came right. pulling up, I came pulling up the road and everybody was like, no, no, get back, get back, get back. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. And then uh, my friend, our mutual friend brought me up and introduced the fence. I was like, what are you guys doing? He was like, we're blowing that fucking yeah, house we're gonna up. Blow I was like, let me back up a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, and that was the was day that for we a met. movie? No, that was for the TV this is for show. The TV show. So the TV yeah, show, we yeah. did these custom builds. They're like far fetched, ridiculous builds. We just made, we had fun, and so in that one, I believe we made our own kind of like, kind of like a rocket launcher, but it was just firing a one round, a giant round into a house, and then we were going to try and make it explode. So we had to rig the house with like gasoline and tannerite and trying to hit it perfectly. <laughs> and uh, when we did it, the whole it was it was like a, a double wide trailer. I mean, the thing engulfed. It actually burned up four of our cameras. It, it went up so fast, we didn't expect it. And we couldn't pull the cameras out in time. And it just, it went, it was crazy. And it was so hot. I'm telling the camera guy, like, I'm burning up, dude. <laughs> Call cut. Call cut. Like, it was starting to burn me, dude. It was crazy, man. So that was, you know, I, th I think that's one of the episodes that never got aired. If I, if I remember correctly, I don't think that ever got aired because I think that was episode six and it just never happened. So, yeah, man. So that's what got me here to Utah. But it's been uh, up and up since that. Yeah, man. Since then, we just keep on pump, pumping out, right? We, you know, we've started businesses. We've 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 pushed into Hollywood, and and we're what we're doing now is more of what I've wanted to do my whole life is the real acting, producing kind of yeah. space. Dude, I love that. I love that because I, I shared with you a little bit earlier how I, I was into the acting thing. Never really did too much, but I really liked it. I found like a natural. I don't know. Like I felt natural behind the camera. Yeah. I remember being a kid, and this was you know my. I, I shared with you a little bit about my, my family and my yeah. history and stuff like that. You know, my, my dad went to prison when I was about seven, eight years old. And uh, my mom was like, I got to do something with my kids. I got to like, yeah. try to make some money from these fucking kids. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So she, she put me in all these like modeling things and stuff like that. And we got invited to like New York and all these places. But I think they're just trying to make money on their stuff. Like they kind of yeah. get you to come here and pay all this fucking money, right? Yeah. And so, and so, but she took me actually, uh, someone she knew took me to an audition for Nike it was for a golf commercial. Yeah. And I remember uh, I never played golf in my life. I was like fucking eight years old, nine years old. Not a lot of us have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. At the, at the, yeah, really, right? And so and so I go to this audition, and in the scene, what, what they wanted you to do is, uh, as a kid, they wanted you to swing the club and act like you hit a hole-in-one, but you were alone on the golf course. And so they wanted to get a natural reaction. What would you do yeah. if you hit a hole-in-one and nobody was around? Yeah. And so I'm like, well, I would go crazy because I don't even know what the fuck that is, but I'm thinking it's Sounds a good dope. thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I don't know how to swing a club. <laughs> so I like swing it like a baseball bat. And I think I even hit the ground. And then I like threw it and jumped up and down. You know what I mean? But uh, I definitely didn't get the part. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely didn't get the fucking part. Yeah. But but um, just that whole experience, I was like, dude, all you got to do is like fuck around on camera like Bro. how cool is that like i would love to do that for a living you know yeah what I mean? dude i tell you what the first audition i ever did so i did two years of college um junior college and i was doing theater yeah because it's an easy a right that was my coach was like look you want yeah. to pass your class I, you know i'm dyslexic i struggled in education my whole yeah. life and yeah, i'm like too. look all i want to do is play baseball so whatever fucking class you could line up for me i'm down and he goes theater there's chicks in there and it's easy. And I was like, well, let's go. You know what I mean? And like, that was genuinely my coach's information. I said, let's yeah. do it. I showed up there. I'm like, man, I, I don't know if I could do this, you know? And we started doing the theater stuff and started doing some improv. It was an improv class was the first one I had. And he's like, can you pretend to come home drunk and trying to sneak back in the house? And I was like, oh yeah. Easy. Dude, this all the time. Yeah. I'm a yeah. pro at this. That's shit. a what Friday, Saturday night I'm at my drunk house. Drunk right now. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. So I do it, and, and after the class, he goes, "You know, Mr. Vargas, I think you should really take a look at this. So you, you did really good. I think you're a natural." And I was like, ah, "Whatever." Yeah. yeah. I finally kind of get motivated, and I get my first chance to do this open audition for a Toyota commercial. And remember, I tell you, I'm dyslexic, right? So the hand, it wasn't like, "Here's your sides, study them, come in tomorrow and do it." No, they show up. That goes, "Here you go, read this, introduce yourself, and go." And I was like, my name is Vincent Vargas. Here we go. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. I know the feeling. Yeah, right? yeah. Alan, Alan over here like, that was me last week. That was me last week. <laughs> Bro, the camera's on. First time ever with the camera yeah. in my face. Reading lines I've never read before. My dyslexia and as well as my anxiety yep. are kicking in and yeah. the words are jumping. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck this. And I was yeah. like, I'm good, thank you. And I was sweating, bro. And I ran out this motherfucker. And I, I ran so fast, I don't think the meter clicked down to a minute, right? Like, I'm like, boom, 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 home. And told my mom, I was like, I'm never doing this shit again. 
Like, I'm ne- I just can't. It was yeah. too much pressure on a guy who already has no confidence in reading, yeah. who's never been in front of a camera, and all of a sudden getting thrown into it thinking I got this. Man, I was like, I was so fucking embarrassed. I was yeah. so embarrassed. Yeah. I never looked back again, dude. Yep. In the military, we do these things called skits. And so after every deployment or after every big training cycle, you kind of make fun of your support, your senior leaders, and there's no repercussion. And so I got really good at that. And I'm making fun of everybody in the fucking room. You know what I mean? And everyone's like, go oh, fire yourself. And I'm like, yeah. You know, so I started getting used to being in front of the crowd. And then you're training people. And that's really how I Confidence. started. Yeah, I really started to build like, oh, I can do this. And who gives a fuck? Right? There we go. Yeah. yeah. I had that happen to me, and it was from this little old LDS lady, and I would have never expected her to do this and tell me what she told me, but I was trying to do, I was trying to get better at public speaking, and so I signed up to this class. It was called uh, Toastmasters. Nice. And, uh, dude, uh, I, I know a lot about yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, and so I was like, okay, here's my game plan. I'm going to pick the Toastmasters, because they have a ton of them here in Salt mm-hmm. Lake. I'm going to choose the one that has the least amount of people. <laughs> yeah. the, the least popular Toastmasters group, right? Yeah. So I found one that was like three guys. And I'm like, I can do it three guys, like talking yeah. for the three people. No problem. That's not going to be a problem at all. Right. And so this one was called Metro Masters downtown in the city. And I loved it because I live downtown and yeah. I'm like, oh, I can walk here every day. Right. So I end up going to this uh, uh, Toastmasters into the top of the Key Bank building. And I'm like, cool, I'm going to do my first speech here. This is going to be my icebreaker speech. Right. Yeah. I'm going to prepare it. I got a cool story. It's like a three to five minute speech. It's about me and what I do and stuff like that. <clears throat> so. We plan it. I'm at home writing it. It's flawless. No ums. I'm like, fuck yeah, there's no ums in this fucking speech, right? I get to the top of the building. I go in the room. I've already talked to these guys. These fucking guys interview like 30 people or invite like 30 people. And I'm like at the front of the room. I'm like (laughs) suited and booted. I looked apart. And all of a sudden the room starts piling full of people. And it's like all the people from the Key Bank building who are on the lunch break. I'm like, these fuckers aren't even supposed to be in here. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all going to judge work. me. Yeah, they're all going to judge me. <laughs> and I'm like, shit. And so I'm like, bro, I read my fucking speech instead of speak it yeah, to people. Of course. And I didn't even look at the audience, right? And they're like, oh, dude, you have a cool story. Like, we, 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 we like your speech. And they, they judge you. They write this like little card to you. And the, everybody's card was like, Bro, you fucking suck. <laughs> They're like, you didn't even look at us once. Like, uh, what are you doing? Harsh, man. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, fuck. They're all just piling on the desk. I'm like looking at them. After the class, this I felt just like you. Yeah. I was embarrassed. I was sweating. I felt so nervous. And I'm like, what a fucking failure. Like, couldn't even do that. Like, what am I doing here? And this little old lady came up to me after. This little old LDS lady. And she grabbed me by my shoulders. Like this, like Tony Robbins shit, right? Yeah. And she shook me. And she said, there comes a time in your life where you just need to stop giving a fuck about what anybody <laughs> thinks yeah. about you. Yeah. It's awesome. And it hit me. And I'm like, oh, my God, she's right. Like, yes. I just not need to not care what anybody thinks. Yeah. And after that, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to give up on this shit. I'm going to get better at this. Yeah. And I'm going to start really doing this, you know. Yeah. But, dude, when she did that, it, like, like snapped Bro, me it's, out of it's, it. It's, it's, once you get to that men- mental space. Yeah. Of public speaking, of yeah. acting, of all these little spaces where you have to be in front of people and kind of engage, game over, dude. You own that space. You know what yeah. I mean? And these, I, I feel when I'm in the moment, right? I feel when I'm in the zone. I mm-hmm. tell my wife, she goes, "You were in the zone." It's like, yeah, yeah. I know when I'm in it because I, I don't even I notice anyone, and sometimes I notice specific people, but I'm talking right to them. You know, these little things, and I'm like, I was in it. I felt it. You know, yeah. what I mean? and when you're in that zone, it's a fuck everyone. I run this shit. You know what I mean? Your, your confidence levels through the roof. I for sure. Like once, when you're in that moment, when you're in the zone. You're like, oh my God, like you feel untouchable, you feel unstoppable. You're yeah. like, hey, like I can't fuck up. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I have two voices. One saying, Kel, yeah, you're killing it. And the other one just boom, 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 putting out information yep. perfectly. Yep. You know, it's yep. like, yeah. And that's that's acting though. That's acting. That's what acting is is for us. Is uh, you know, how do you play this big tough guy on television who's a who's in a motorcycle gang? I was like, it's acting. I fucking pretend that I'm that motherfucker for that moment yeah. and I fucking kill it because I don't give a shit what anyone thinks. Yeah. You know, and, and that's that's how you become good at that. Like yeah. your willingness to be uncomfortable, your willingness to look like a complete fucking idiot on film and not give a fuck that the nation's gonna see that and judge it. No, yeah. no, no. That's how they believe it. You know, yeah. and it has became or become a therapeutic value in my life. It's actually, I believe, saved my life. I think acting has saved me from millions of other things that I could have been doing, but because it actually has helped me um, use my real emotions, it's given me permission to feel, yeah. right? You know what? I'm so yeah. happy you said that. Yeah. My wife and I had a conversation like a month ago, <clears throat> and uh, 
So I've been on this weight loss journey. I've lost like 60 pounds in the yeah. last like eight months. Congratulations. And yeah, dude. It's been fucking hard. I man. think you gave yeah. them to me. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been, it's been hard. And like I was telling the wife, she's, she's like, what are you going to do? I'm like, well, I have a photo shoot on a plan. I'm like three weeks away from the photo shoot we're going to do. And I'm, I'm like, damn, I got to lose like 20 pounds in the next three weeks. I'm going to be like sticking my finger down my throat. <laughs> <laughs> but, Don't try this at home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm like, I'm like, I want to do this photo shoot and I'm going to send it to, and I talked to this guy, he's, he's a, an agent, you know, over here. Yeah. And uh, he's like, yeah, send me your portfolio, you know, and I send him some of my old stuff and I'm going to send him some stuff and I want to, I want to start acting again. And, and I talked to her about that. Oh, I can help you. Yeah. But we'll talk about that. Yeah. Let's Go talk ahead. about it after. Right. And so, and so we were talking and she's like. She's like, uh, well, why do you want to do that? Like, what's the point? And, and what kind of roles would you want? Yeah. And I'm like, well, fuck, if I can get to the body and the image I want, like, I feel like I have good hair. I would do some mob role stuff, you know, and yeah. I love the mob stuff. And, uh, you know, my family, I can harness those emotions. I've been in those situations yep. and exactly what you're saying. And I'm like, I can bring up those emotions that a lot of people can't because I've never been in that, those positions. Yeah. So I can really feel what you're saying and yeah. it makes sense. Think about this, man. So one of the best actors on Minds MC, and I say actors because he is the root of who we are, is the guy who plays Marcus Alvarez, right? Emilio Rivetta. He is the G, like straight up old school gangbanger that was from Frogtown, LA, that was a heroin addict who's now 31 years sober, right? As his transition of getting out of gangs and trying to find his life, he said, I wanted to get into acting, but none of the, at the time, none of the white studios would even take him serious because he shows up looking like a cholo. That's all he uh, knew. It's yeah. his culture. He goes to Glendale Community College, same college I went to by chance, just, you know, goes to a, an acting coach there and the acting coach told him, like, like, I really think you have this, but let's do one-on-one -on -one sessions. And he said for a year straight, he cried almost every single session because he's this tough guy, this Latino, this machismo that, that our culture tends to kind of breed. But a lot of males uh, of our age, our fathers were like, don't cry. Don't be, oh, a, yeah. don't be a bitch. No emotions. Yeah, don't no be a emotions. Rah, rah, rah. And no. so they don't realize that, <clears throat> look, they didn't realize what they were putting upon us, but we were, we now are turning into this callous individual that doesn't want to express, which it is healthy to allow a lot of these emotions yeah. out the, the right way. Instead, we're doing it the unhealthy way by drinking our asses off and, you know, partaking Fighting in drugs and whatnot. Exactly. Shit. All yeah. these unhealthy ways of trying to get this uh, this trauma off of our chest. Emilio said to me in an interview I did with him, and it was just beautiful. He said, he made me human again. Acting made him human again. And I thought that was so gorgeous because a guy who was legitimate bad dude was saying, like, he needed to be human again. And that's why I feel, when he said that, it put it to perspective for me. I was like, yeah, that's what it did for me as well. Like, it gave me the the the, the permission to cry, to feel, to to really dissect emotions and, and where I should feel emotion, right? Like most of my life has been like, oh, this guy died. <clears throat> and that sucks. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, next, you know what I mean? And that is not healthy, especially if someone who's really close to you, you know? And and having the empathy is what I, I lacked for so many years because I didn't want to allow myself to give a fuck about other people's situations. And, and I think throughout the past years, I've just even more, man, I, I cry on the dumbest shit now. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Someone could pass a fart. I'm like, oh, that's so sad. You know, <laughs> whatever the case. But these really, really weird things now make me emotional because I can feel what it's like, you know? So like, like families and kids, like my son the other day, he found his nipples. It's just so, so dope. He's one and a half years old and he found his nipples. He was like, oh shit. And he looks at me and goes, oh shit. Right. And he's, and he's touching it. And I'm like, man, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. This kid is experiencing life and enjoying it. I never in a million years would have appreciated yeah. that moment. But now I'm so vulnerable to what's reality and life yep. and growth that watching him do that, I was like, fuck. I, I, I'm a, such a better dad now than I ever was because I have so much more emotion to give. Yeah. Huh. Well, yeah. I feel like so many people, they, that, they, they all want to put on that tough, you know, that tough face and everything. Just like, hey, I need to be tough for my, you know, for my son or right. for my daughter. Like, for example, I, I have a daughter on the way now in two months. Congratulations. And thank you, man. First one. So I'm like, man, like, is it nerve wracking? Yeah, it is, you know. <sighs> but I'm like, I'm looking forward to it. I want to just tell the whole world, like, hell yeah, I can't wait to, you know, go out with my little daughter, take yeah. her out to the park and everything. So I'm looking forward to it. But growing up, you know, in the era that we pretty much grew up, oh, yeah. our parents are extremely hard-headed, yeah. extremely stubborn. Oh, yeah. For example, I don't even think my dad has ever told me he didn't love me, for oh, example. Yeah. It was like until later on in life. Yeah. I'm like, you know, because it's just not something that they, they it did. It was a different era. It yeah. looked like weakness. It looked like yeah. femininity. Yeah. Right? They were fear yeah. of being feminine, which to me is like, 
huh? My dad never changed a fucking diaper. If you met my dad, he's a dope dude. He's yeah. really, really cool. But for him changing a diaper when I was younger at that time was like, that's a woman's job. Yep. And then when I was, a, I was a single dad, you know, I had a baby at a young age and, and the mom and me were not together at the time. And so I had my daughter, I was changing his diaper. And he goes, Vinny, go take her to your mom. And I'm like, it's my daughter, dude. Yeah. It's my job. <laughs> yeah. It's my job. Yeah. Bro. I'm going to change her diaper, dude. And I'm, you know, and it's this funny thing where we, we've had to grow, but you're right. Like we were told to be tough, but like tough, de their definition was wrong. Yeah. Right? I think tough is being willingness to be uh -huh. vulnerable. Right. Yeah. I think. That's just that is yeah that is I had a student in my school my hair school right <clears throat> so I, I grew up with this kid not the student I grew up with this kid and he's he was on our block uh, when I lived in uh, West Valley City for a while and he was uh, we didn't know this because we were young we we're like eight nine ten eleven we grew up around that age right with him he was a couple years older than me he's about my, my brother's age I knew he was kind of slow I didn't really know that at that age because. I was probably slow too. <laughs> eight years old, right? We're all a little slow at eight. Yeah. yeah. Right. But I found out from his mom that he had the mind of an eight year old, even at 12, 13, it started to develop. He wasn't right. So we always looked out for him and I got him a job at my, at my hair school as the guy holding the sign, $5 hair. Yeah. And he was hella good at it. <laughs> the dude would drive traffic, bro. Like we yeah. put him in a gorilla costume and he was out there break dancing. <laughs> the dude was this shit. Right. <clears throat> and so we're going to do that same thing later to get people in here for real estate. <laughs> yeah, <That's smart. laughs> right. And, 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 and I love the guy. I still do. We talked to him still. He moved to Texas, but we've known each other our whole lives and I've always looked out for him. And, uh, this kid, he, uh, came from the streets, this other kid, this gangbanger. Yeah. He was still stuck in that mentality at lifestyle. He was like 19 at the time. And, uh, he thought I would respond to him like in a positive way yeah. by acting tough. Yeah. Right, and he's trying to get my attention all the time by acting cool, acting tough. I could see right through it, you know what I mean. And yeah. uh, one day we we're in the back parking lot, just I think everybody's back there, like talking, hanging out, going to our cars, right? And he was like, "Hey, bro, check this out." He showed me a gun in his bag, and I was like, "Why are you showing me that? Like, you think I care about yeah. that, bro?" I'm like, "Hey, first of all, don't bring that shit to my school, yeah. right?" And I was like, "Another thing, I'm like, bro, that doesn't make you tough, right?" Yeah. This kid was probably 85 pounds. Okay, yo, skinny, skinny, scrawny yeah. kid, and I'm like, I can, I'm trying to empathize, like, like be sympathetic or empathetic towards yeah. him, and understand that he's probably he probably feels vulnerable all the time. Yeah, you know what I mean, be, right. being how, how small he is, um, so he probably has to put on this front or he thinks he has to, to yeah. impress people. But I want my school to be a safe place, right? Yeah. Not for that shit. And uh, one day, so I knew that that's how he was, right? Little gangbanger kid. One day we had a, a party at the school and we were doing karaoke. Yeah. And I get up there to break the ice and fucking make a fool of myself, right? I don't care. And my homeboy gets up there. My crazy homie, right? Yeah. He was always our wingman because he had, he could not feel embarrassed at all. Yeah. So we could be like, bro, at like 13, 14, go get that girl's number for us. And he'd yeah. go right up to her and get her number, right? So we used him for that. And so I, I saw that the students were super nervous and very embarrassed and they didn't want to get up there and do karaoke. And it was like dead in the room. I'm like, come on, man. Like, get up here. And, I'm like, Eric, come up here and show these guys what to do. So Eric gets up there and starts rapping. And he, he, <laughs> his speech is not the best. Yeah. So it sounds really funny. He starts break dancing, and I'm like, "That's how you get the party started, right?" <clears throat> and I noticed that kid was really embarrassed. That gangbanger kid, yeah. who's supposed to be a tough guy, right? And he can't get up there and sing karaoke. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, after we were talking, and he was like, "Damn, bro, I don't know how you do that." He became vulnerable with me. This kid. Yeah. He's like, I don't know how you do that, man. He's like, I don't know how you get up there and 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 talk in front of people and have a good time, make a fool of yourself. I can't do that. Yeah. And I was like, look, man, I was like, you think you're a tough guy. I was like, you're really not. Right. Yeah. I was like, that's a tough guy up there. Eric, yeah. he can get up there and make a fucking fool of himself. Doesn't phase him at all. Doesn't phase him at all. No. I was like, try doing that shit. You think it's, you think you're tough carrying a gun in your fucking bag? Yeah. Bro. I was like, try doing what he just did. Right. I was like, that's a fucking tough guy. When I was explaining it to him, it hit him. And he was like, damn you're right like i'm a fucking pussy <laughs> like, <straight laughs> up. Like, yeah you're like, a bitch dude <laughs> like, like, yeah. <laughs> he was so scared to get up there and just you know make a fool of himself but but i think it's because again a lot of these people are afraid to be vulnerable because of the way, the way they're raised yeah you know their parents like my my dad you know he wasn't a tough guy he didn't act like that at all but uh you know when i found out older when i was older and the way he raised us, he kind of was, you yeah. know, and, and, and he would not show emotions, never said, I love you. Right. And I was the one who started doing that to him when I was yeah. older, when I became more vulnerable, when I became, yeah. you know, more, more, uh, comfortable with, 
you know, being open about my emotions and my yeah. feelings. And uh, I just, I'm like, fuck, there's so many people who struggle with that still. Yeah, you man. Know, because of their parents. The men, men tend to be raised with a lot of insecurities. Yeah. And those l- l- insecurities and ego is what kind of drives guys to to kind of be the personalities that you kind of see. Yeah. And you're like, ah, oh, that guy, that guy is, he's not comfortable in his own skin. So yeah. he has to put this, you know, mm-hmm. this fake bravado kind of mentality and there's no reason for it, right? Like, I like the dude, I, I, and we see through it. That's the funny yeah. thing. It's like, oh, we, yeah. oh, yeah. us as men, are like, ah, oh, okay, that guy's insecure about something. There's no reason for it, right? But especially in a room like, I don't, I don't care. I'm proud of all of you guys who have yeah. success. And for some reason, some guys tend to just <laughs> spill ego. Uh-huh. And that is, that is, that is something that is, you know, raising them into things yeah. that, that makes you masculine and that makes you manly and that makes you, you know, successful or whatever the case. And, and in the end of the day, you know, that's all relative. Especially yeah. in a lot of, a lot of the VA world, a lot of the military world too. Oh, bro. I, the, I mean, perfect example. I had, I, you know, I was in a relationship for a while and it ended and I was really distraught and then we had an exercise, right? Starting literally the next day. Yeah. I went to my master sergeant shop chief and was like, Hey, I'm struggling. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, and luckily at the time I wasn't one of those guys that couldn't, you know what I mean? That was like, oh, I'm just going to press through and I don't really yeah. give a shit, you know? So same kind of thing went in, talked to him, said, look, man, I'm, I'm, I'm really a mess. I just, I just, I need a few minutes, man. I just can have a hug. <laughs> like yeah. something. Blew me off, you know? Damn. And then, and the next morning I woke up and that was, that was the first time in my, in my early military career where I realized, you know, I mean, I, I, I have depression. I, you know, the VA, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm disabled technically. Right. And that was the first moment that I realized that I had a disability Yeah, is, is because the next morning I woke up and I, and that was the first time in my mind that I was like, wow, you know, maybe ending things would be easier than dealing yeah. with this, you know, and it all is the same kind of thing. Had I had, had there been a, uh, you know, a safer place and someone that, that understood like, Hey, you know, this, this kid needs some, some talking to cause he's letting out those emotions on the other side of things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It probably it would have been a very different week. Right? right. I wouldn't have ended up in the, you know, the damn mental hospital for a couple of days on base. Right. But, um, so yeah, I mean, same kind of, same kind of thing. I mean, I, 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 you start to realize and separate those people where you're like, look, you don't have to be that hard just because we, you know, we put right. a uniform on. You can still take care of your troops and you can be empathetic <clears throat> to their cause and still be a good soldier. You know, yeah, that's, you know, in the, in the military space where we struggle and, and where I do a lot of my advocacy, right, uh, is is trying to get to those guys with egos, right? Those alpha male types that are, are tough guys go to war, but they don't want to knock down that persona just to be honest and say, yeah, but war still haunts me. You know yeah. what I mean? And I have issues. And, and that's kind of my, my work outside of acting is veteran advocacy because those egos that we're talking about, those that machismo, that tough guy mentality is what I believe is killing a lot of veterans because they're not willingness to fi- seek help, not willingness to, to be vulnerable, not, not willingness to, to kind of, uh, you, you know, sh- put down the bottle because that's what we've been taught is how we handle things. And so, you know, my job is trying to be an advocate for them and saying, Hey, I'm a big scary dude. And if I wanted to, <laughs> I could fuck you up myself, <laughs> but you know, I have these weaknesses, you know, I have these, these, these little issues that I still struggle with from combat and I go to counseling and counseling cool. And I've taken the route of sobriety because I feel like that's what I needed to do. You know, and it takes guys with, with, you know, that people look up to essentially that to be influencers, right. And to help provide that, I guess that comfortable route, you know, bridging that gap of like tough guy to counseling. And so that's a big thing is what you were kind of hinting on is like these egos is what to me is killing a lot of our veterans. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> in my honest opinion, I feel like if you know you're a tough guy, if you are willing to get counseling, because I feel like too many people have it backwards. Where yeah. it's like, if I don't go get counseling, if I don't go talk to a coach, or if I don't sh- you know share my story, whatever it might be, yeah. that's going to be have the opposite effect. Yeah, it's not. No, counseling is cool. Yeah, you know, and that we get we got to push that more. I, you oh, know, it's so cool. It, it's like yeah. you know, you don't just drive around the car and never get an oil change. Exactly. You know what I'm saying I go get an oil change. You know, I go talk to my counselor. You know, and there's these moments where I'm like, I probably need to make another call soon. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. When I start to feel these, you know, I struggle and, and, and I'll be open about it. Like I struggle with post-traumatic stress. You know, I, I in, in mine is probably a little bit different than some, you know, um, I have my struggles with, 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 um, you know, survival's guilt, but what haunts me more than anything was the events that happened overseas that I never expected. Right. Like I, I joined as an infantry man. I joined in special operations and I knew what my job was going to be going overseas and kicking in doors and, and, you know, killer capture missions and, and all these cool things. Right. Like all these cool guy stuff. But what I didn't expect is, is to see, you know, the, some of the collateral damage that happens of war. What I didn't expect to see was working on, you know, 
kids who are, who are burned or, or, or hurt. You know what I mean? And those are the things that probably stick with me more than anything in a negative way. Right. Like Mm -hmm. when, when you go to combat in your head, there's this enemy. And then when you go actually to Afghanistan or Iraq, you know, everyone's wearing the same exact uniform, right? Your opposing force is, is that a bad guy or not? You know, these, these questions that we leave lingering in our heads are things that you have to somehow cope with and accept and acceptance of, of, of things that you see is, is the hardest thing to do when you question what was right and wrong. Right. If you have moral compass, you know, there's a right and wrong. Right. And if you go overseas and you can't identify if it was a right or a wrong decision, that'll haunt you. Anyone that has a conscience, you know what I mean? And so, you know, I have a I have a, a thing that bothers me about burned because I worked on a couple of kids that were burned and, and, you know, they ended up passing, which is very unfortunate. But, you know working on someone who's burned, you smell that flesh of burning, right? And it might be a little graphic for some listening, but but those are the things that continue that I don't realize affect me. And then all of a sudden you burn the ham and boom, you're you're back in Afghanistan and you're thinking about it. And you're like in this pause mode. I'm always like, you good? And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I was gone for a minute, right? I'm in this this zone of like thinking about these fucking kids and like this this conundrum of you're an American, but you're working on Afghani kids and you're trying to keep them alive. And what a weird thing. If the roles were reversed, would they give a shit about my kids? And like this, this really, uh, it affects you in this very, very um, deep, like way where you don't expect. And so <clears throat> I know that what my trigger is, right. And I know where I need to be careful about because, um, the most uncomfortable thing for a man is, is not being in control of yourself, you know? And that's why alcohol for me is like, nah, get out of here. Cause I don't, con- I'm not very good in that. Yeah. And then knowing that there's still something in me that I can't control bothers me, right? That really kind of like, oh, that sucks, you know? And so me and my wife, we know what what I should and shouldn't be around and how to navigate that, right? But I learned that through counseling. I learned that through really deep diving on what affects me and how it's affected and trying to heal that, you know? And I've also realized that alcohol makes it even worse. And so let's push that to the side too. And so these are things that most people need to do, not just veterans, right? This isn't just, mental health is not a veteran, you know, monopoly, no. right? We don't have a monopoly <laughs> on it. It's for everybody. Right, it's for everyone. Yeah. It's, it's for, we have to deep dive in some of our traumas and see what is it that affects me and how can I heal that, right? And what triggers it, right? Alcohol triggers for everyone. Like, let's just be honest. Alcohol is that one thing, like if you're an emotional man, put some alcohol in your body and you're 10 times now emotional. I <laughs> am no longer allowed to have fireball. <laughs> there you go. It's about about a year and a half thing. That, yeah, I can't even. I, it's not even allowed in the room with me. Right, and that's what I'm saying. You know, we have to identify those those things. But yeah, man. So that's that's my whole mental health kind of advocacy kind of spiel. Is you know, I struggle with it myself. You see me on TV. We got 250 keys of heroin sitting on the south side. Gilly, get it done. Use an extra set of hands at the rig. Still. I have my struggles. You know what I mean? You, you can follow me and think like, man, this guy is super successful. That doesn't mean I don't have baggage with me. You know what I mean? Like like everyone you watch on TV, on television, all these influencers, all these Kim Kardashians, all these people that we all follow and they influence and they and, and kids are f- trying to be like, they have baggage too, right? Oh, Just because yeah. we, we post our highlights on Instagram, right? We don't yeah. post our downfalls, yeah. you know what I mean? And and that's, you know, that's just the reality of it. And so all these kids that are influenced by people, remember, we're all human, right? And we're all suffering from the same little thing, right? It's going to be some kind of heartbreak, going to be some kind of financial thing, going to be some kind of, you know, all these little things, like we're all the same motherfucker, you know what I mean? And we all go through the same shit. So it's all relatable once people start talking real. When you start being vulnerable and saying yeah. real, everyone's like, oh, man, me I, too. I recognize that shit, man. Yeah. I recognize that shit. You know, I, uh, when, going back to the whole public speaking thing, when I, when I wanted to get better at it, I sought help. And I was looking at the Dale Carnegie, like uh, training the yeah. friends, influence other thing, you know, and, and these guys came over to my school and we talked and I just didn't feel that connection with them. I felt like I was being sold on something. Yeah. So I started Googling for life. Uh, uh, I started Googling for public speaking coaching and stuff like that. And I think Google took the word coaching and recommended life coaches. Yeah. And I've heard of them before and I'm like, Oh, not these fucking life coaches. Oh, <laughs> God, these people are not qualified. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, this girl who went through a breakup and now she's a life coach. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, fuck, let me just call. So I started calling and, and I, I found this one and it was clarity coaching. Nice. And uh, I called her and I told her, yeah, I want to work on, you know, public speaking. And she's like, well, let me tell you what I do. And she told me what she did. And I was like, that doesn't sound like public speaking coaching, but she's like, I think you should come try it out. So I went and tried it out. Did one session. It was in a group. It was a group session, and I went in there, and she had me do this exercise. And it's like, uh, what you're believing is it true? Can you absolutely know that's true? Uh, who would you be without that thought? And I'm like, that's pretty cool, you know. So I, I want to try it again. So I went in again, and this was a private session. And remember, I'm getting out of this lifestyle that I was in that was probably not the best for me yeah. and my family. Um, <clears throat> I was be trying to become a more 
uh, legitimate entrepreneur. Yeah. Right. And so when I went in there, I had all this fucking baggage that I didn't realize I had. Yeah. And I was in the, my, my new business. Right. And it was a school, it was education. I was an instructor and I was going through all the entrepreneurial struggle, struggle, stress, right. Extremely yeah. high stress. And, uh, I go in there and we start talking and she hits on a nerve and I start crying. I haven't cried in 14 years at that point. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know what that was what like. What is this? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what that was like. It was so fucking crazy. And she's like, this is what it's like to be normal, by the way. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I'm like, what is this? Like, it's, it's insane, dude. Yeah. And, and I think Alan experienced something similar, you know? And, and I was just like, damn, like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Like for holding this in, like, that was really hard for me to get that out. Yeah. Like, and now I feel extremely like happy being able to get that out. And now dude, I'll cry in movies. Like, I don't care. Yeah. You know what I mean? He has a shit. But, but like going back to the whole mental health thing and I'm not a veteran, Yeah. but it's like how many other people, especially entrepreneurs that deal with these high level levels of stress, anxiety, Tons. um, you know, failures, failure, right? failure, failures. failure, <laughs> failure, yeah. right? That's, yeah. the, that's the one thing that people got to realize you got to, you got to get used to failing. Well, you, you got to be good. You have to have resiliency yeah. is yes. what it is, right? You have to have resiliency. Like, cause, and resiliency means you bounce back, uh -huh. right? Because we fail all day long. Yep. Everything I've ever done is a failure, right? Yep. Everyone's like, oh man, you're so successful. It's like, ah, that's 10% of everything else I fucked up. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you guys are seeing the 10% that is successful. You don't see the 90% of fuck up, right? Yep. Like failure, failure. Like, so it's all based off resiliency. When you said like relatability is the key. Yeah. Like relatability to me is like the key. Cause like you can go to every entrepreneur out there and tell them like, like everyone knows if you're an entrepreneur, you failed. You know what I mean? There, oh, there's, yeah. there, that's yeah. not even a conversation. The real ones know that shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's not even a conversation. That that's like part of the bag. You yeah. know what I mean? Here's a little bit of failure. Here's a little bit of success. You know what I mean? You just want the success to be a little bit heavier than the failure. It keeps yeah. going up a little bit, little. Yeah. Go back, yeah. then go up. Go right. Back, yeah. Go down. Yeah. But I think because the, the kids nowadays who are growing up, who are, are getting into becoming self-employed, and yeah. they're like, "Hey, fuck yeah. the nine to five because I've heard it on Instagram is not the place to go yeah. and, and do," and and they see people, they see their profiles, and they assume that. Like, I guess they're not accounting for failure that's coming up. No, and, for sure. And, well, that, when, that, and when they hit that, like, they don't know how to, yeah, because I feel like not a lot of people are talking about it well, enough. Yeah. I want to hear your mean? point real quick, but I'm going to, I'm, yeah. I'm going to tell you, it roots from the beginning from when they're really young. No, yeah. I had a thought, you know, I met, um, when it comes down to the influencers and everything, too many people get caught up in looking at people that made it and everything. Yeah. Cause I'll have that happen multiple times. People reach out to me and go, man, I want your lifestyle. I want this. I yeah. want that. I'm like, dude, no, you don't yeah. like you want your best. You, you want to be the best version of yourself that you can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be anybody. I love me and I want to be me. Well, you, and, you know, and, and everybody should want to be them at the yeah. end of the day. To them, you're an overnight success, but exactly. to them, they don't know that overnight <laughs> success took ten years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what I'm people don't realize that where you fuck, you put, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. You know, living in your parents' basement, saving up, and yeah. this and that, putting your whole life on whole year over year over year. People don't realize that, yeah, and then I don't know where you show up. Cool, you get a Lambo, you get this, you get that. Automatically, oh, this 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 guy came overnight. I mean. Blew up overnight. No, it didn't happen yeah. overnight. Well, it took years to get there. Right. And failures. You know what it starts is our kids with, 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 you know, with ideologies and mentalities, right? Like when you start telling kids that everyone's a winner, you start taking away from them what hard work is. Yeah. Right? When you start telling everyone, everyone won. Like bullshit. Yeah, hard work, hard that. work, hard work won. Yep. Like I don't let my kids beat me in basketball. I don't give a shit. Yep. Right? <laughs> I, I don't care who you are. When you beat me, you actually fucking beat me. Yep. And you can take that to the bank and feel good about it. But until then, I'm going to kick your ass all day long. I don't care what it is because I'm teaching my kids the truth. Yeah. I don't raise William Hong's man to believe that they can sing, right? You know what I'm saying? William Hong went into the American Idol thinking he can sing. And all, that, all, the, all, all the judges are like, no, you can't. You know, I don't raise these false, like, personalities that think that they're winners. Like, no, no, you win when you fucking win. And when you lose, all that means is that you need to fucking work harder right. to fucking win. You know what I mean? And all these kids that we're raising these days and all these people, you say, like, oh, they all won. I coached the baseball team the other day, right? Like, this is when my, my son and, and the parents were yelling at me, like, my son doesn't play as much as that son. I was like, well, that son's pretty good. And your son yeah. sucks. And your son's <laughs> not as good. And so I get him in in the required two, two innings, right, yeah. in his one at bat. And then when I see him working harder, I'll give him more opportunity. Yeah. But until then, I want to teach my kids what it feels like to win. Mm -hmm. And I'm not this guy where, like, we got to win. Like, no, no, no. We work hard and we win. And we lost every single game. Every single game. We, we got one tie, and that was a fucking win in my book. You know what I mean? Because I got handed the fucking soup sandwich. I got handed, like, you know, the bad news bears because, <laughs> because it's just I was a new coach, and I didn't go to the, the you know what I mean? So I had just, just the, the lot of kids yeah. that never really played. We did fucking awesome. 
By the end of the by the end of the season, we're competing. And the parents didn't understand. They're so mad. I was like, look, if my son wasn't getting playing time and I was mad, I'd take him to another league. Or I'd work with him more on your own. You can't bring him to a team and expect me to fucking make him champs. You know what I mean? Like they gotta do something else. It's called work. You know what I mean? And people are this immediate gratification community that we have now, the immediate gratification social media, right? Let me get information now. And that's what I want to be successful now. You know what I mean? It's like you forget there's so much hard work involved in that. I get guys call me all the time, like, dude, I want to be an actor. I say, cool, man, what have you done? Well, 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 nothing, dude. I'm just messing you first. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing that for? <laughs> what are you doing that for? Get on Google half this shit. You know yeah. what I mean? And like, get out there and do it. This fucking phone right here can do more on the goddamn fucking filming than anything out there right now. Uh. Like, no one wants to put in the work. They want the answer now. They want the money now. They want the success now. They want the fame now. And like, that's all bullshit, dude. Yeah, the whole social media thing, I feel like, is really fucking with a lot of kids' heads. Bro, it's um, a, it's a it's a necessary evil. You know, <laughs> Billy's social media is, looks really good. <laughs> I gotta say, <laughs> uh, uh, looks yeah. really good. And then you meet me in person. You're like, what the fuck? No, no, no. <laughs> no it was the opposite. Here's what happened. You know, because uh, one of our agents was like, oh, hey, bro, you gotta check out this lender. This, like, this isn't gonna be the first time that people have thought I was a douchebag before they met me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, it happens. It I happens thought the same thing. Gave away the fucking punchline. Have you met my wife? <laughs> oh shit, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but you know, my agent, one of my agents, was like, dude, we gotta reach out to this lender because I, I think he's a, a good lender he's obviously yeah. has a good lifestyle he's fucking crushing it we should reach out to him yeah and i'm like nah <laughs> 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 and then billy starts reaching out to us a few months back and he's like dude we should link up you know and and, and alan and i never go to lunch with lenders never waste our time with lenders because they always and just like you know agents and title companies it's they, a waste of time yeah and yeah billy was like bro let me take you guys out to dinner and I'm like, fuck, man, you know what? We just had a terrible relationship with the lender that exposed something that we kind of knew was there. And it's if the lender is not successful, it's not our job to make them successful. Right. I feel like a lot of them reach out to us for that. And I'm like, Billy seems like he, he's already successful. You know, let's talk to him. He could probably handle the volume that we can we can give to him. You know, let, let, let's give him a shot. And Alan was like, okay, let's go. And I think Alan was even like, it's going to be a waste of time. Yep. <laughs> you fucking told me that. <laughs> and I'm like, let's just fucking go, God damn it. So we go over there. We have dinner. The dude knows how to wine and dine people, by the way. Always. A- except for Alan. <laughs> except for Alan, oh, who Alan can't, can't eat shit. anything. And I take the dude to an Italian restaurant. You have a lot Alan, of uh, yeah, allergies? Over that I got one. a lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bro. It's, I, I had water it's left. Insane. Yeah. He had <laughs> fucking water. Yeah. So we have dinner. And I'm like, dude. I fucking like Billy. He's not like his Instagram profile, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> and it's, then, it's Dan Brazilian on his Instagram, right? <laughs> yeah, but that was my own bullshit, right? My own bullshit, right? That, that, <laughs> I, had, that I looked at people who have this, uh, that they present this lifestyle that I'm assuming is bullshit, you know? Yeah. But this is really his lifestyle. That's Billy really, works that's really fucking hard. Really Billy. And, he, and he's earned it and he can show it off because he deserves to, you know what I mean? And and and, and, I, and I really like him for that. I'm telling you that right now. Like, dude, I, I appreciate it. You really d- earn this lifestyle and there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to show that off. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I just think that people who haven't earned that lifestyle look at that and they think like, oh, this guy's a fucking douchebag. Yeah, but it goes you back down I mean? to hard work. Yeah. You know I mean? That yeah. didn't happen overnight. Yep. Yep. And for you as well, it didn't happen overnight, right? Oh, no, man, I've, man, I've, seen, I've seen it all. Yeah. I've seen it come yeah, to we've fruition. Been, we've been friends for a long time, yeah. man. And I've, I've, yeah, I've taken my licks. In fact, this is a funny story. We talk about, you know, basically getting slammed in the face and then still having the perseverance to move on, right? right. So when I got out of the military, I moved back to Florida, right, and was – kind of struggling through college. Well, let's be honest. I was surfing more than I was going to college. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, I was bartending and I was having a good time, but I knew I knew there was no future there, right? And so I was trying to break out of that mold. Um, I didn't have a mentor, you know, and which is why I think a lot of the reason me and Vince, you know, really connect in a lot of ways because there's, you know, there's something we want to provide to these people, you know, they yeah. get out and they're just like, okay, I feel like I can do better, but you know, there's no, there's no one to follow. There's no, no one to tell me that we could do it. So I was bartending one night and I ended up get, talking to this couple and they were there for like five hours and they were both in radio sales. Right. And I had talked to them about some stuff I had done before. And you know, I mean, really as a, as a bartender, you're a little bit of a salesman, you know, I don't yeah. want, I want you to drink the 1942 instead of the 1800. So I get a bigger tip. Right. So anyways, I'm talking to them all night and they're like, Hey, you know, we do radio sales. We think it'd be great. You got a great personality. This and that, they're like, you know, why don't you come in and at least come in and interview. I think we're hiring, right? So uh, about a week later, I finally get a hold of the the hiring, you know, manager or whatever, and I go in and talk to her. And and three minutes in the conversation, this lady is handing me my ass, right? I mean, I went in confident. I went and got a new shirt and a tie, and I thought I was just going to go in there and crush the world, right? <laughs> and literally, first three minutes, what radio station do you listen to? I'm like, uh, slammed, right? I mean, she did not hold back. She really let me have it. And for the first time, when I walked out of that interview, I was like, damn, I'm not shit, right? Yeah. And, it, and, and I had to realize, so two things were going to happen. 
right? Is I was going to walk out of that and I was going to go, I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to be a bartender forever. Right. Or I'm going to walk out and I'm like, you know what? I've got to put more work into my, into this, you know, apparently I'm not the great salesman and shit that I thought I was. So same kind of thing with you guys with acting. And then, you know, the other stuff that you've done is I started putting work into it, you know, reading some sales books and, and starting to do stuff. And yeah, I mean, 22 years later, here we are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But this shit doesn't come easy. It doesn't come overnight. You know what I mean? There is no, there is no fast forward button. I no. mean, it's just, it's just hard work and I've put in a lot of time and I really, that was my defining moment where I realized like, okay, if I want to be something, I've got to fucking work at it, Yep. Yeah. you know, and I've got to earn it yep. every bit of it. Yeah. Just so, uh, you guys can, um, I guess get an update on Billy. Billy is a, a lender here in Utah. Uh, he's with a company called Supreme, uh, Supreme mortgage, Supreme lending. Uh, that company is badass. Uh, we have decided to partner up with Billy and uh, work with him uh, going forward. And we're really excited about that. It's a good that. fit. I feel like yeah, it's, it's a good, good fit, fit for the whole team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 send, some fun shit. I send all the veterans who ask me, every, any veteran asks me, like, hey, man, I want to get my VA loan. Anyone you know understands it. Billy. Every time. Every time. And he's got guys who struggle with income. He's got guys who have bad credit. You know what I mean? I had to work on my credit. You know what I mean? Like, those are things that, like, I've, he's just been like, hey, I'm going to shoot you straight. Here's what we need. He's helped so many of my veteran friends get houses and, yeah. and and some people don't realize how that feels like it what an accomplishment what an accomplishment it is to own a house you mm -hmm. know what i mean especially someone in the military and they're working their ass off and they're you know you're making ends meet in the military and you get out and you're like well let me try and do something let me see if my veteran benefits will actually do anything that's one that will yeah. and and billy's been the guy to have all the answers for every veteran that's ever asked me a question so i always like all day like hey man i want to buy a house you know anyone Psh, billy hit up yeah. billy Billy would connect you with whoever he needs to he, let him do it. And uh, it's been, it's been awesome. And it's been a cool friendship to, for me to kind of provide value to, for the veteran community. If that is what you want is a house, I send them to Billy all day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I, 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 I would too. I mean, that's not just because you're a badass cylinder. I mean, you've been doing this. Are uh, you in the military for 10 years? Yeah. Right. 10 years yeah. plus. Yeah. So yep. learned a lot from the military. Veteran. Appreciate the military. Love yeah. my brothers. You know, I mean, it was, it was definitely a stepping stone. I mean, there's, there's not a day goes by that I don't look at my son and go, man, maybe I should just, kick your ass in there for two years, yeah. and, you know, let you figure it out and then get back out and appreciate hard work and appreciate yeah. dedication and appreciate failure and appreciate camaraderie. Right. And all the things that, you know, that the military military teaches you as a foundation of life before you, yep. you know, get out there and think so that it's, it's going to be handed to it's you. The humbler. Uh, it's the humbler. It's the humbler. It's the humbler. <laughs> yeah, the one for thing, sure. when it comes down to humbling, um, I feel like either, yeah, go to the military or go to like a third world country. Yes. I know I had that because, you know, I came here from Bosnia when I was six and then I didn't go back until, I don't know, my 15, 16 or so. But I remember when I went back, you know, older now, yeah. more, you know, knowing more about it now, I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. Like, it makes you realize and appreciate things. I remember going down there. And then I came back with a different mindset where it made me appreciate everything here that much more. Yeah. And it just wanted me to, wanted me to force me to work even harder as well. Cause I'm like, these guys don't have an opportunity. And I remember being over there with my family and stuff and they were like, man, you know, is there any way for us to come over there? Like I know one of my cousins even contemplated about marrying, I think my brother, she was like, what if I marry you just to get over there? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, that's, you know I mean? that's then, a little edgy. Yeah. I'm like, I was just pushing it. But, 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 but my point would be though, like the uh, extreme lengths that people are willing to go to, yeah, the want to have that better lifestyle, you right. know, like whether you're coming from Bosnia or from Mexico, or it doesn't really matter. Well, it just kind of goes to show you the opportunity that is presented here. If you take it and people yeah. don't realize it. No, and that's why I feel like everybody needs to get out, go visit a third world country. Yeah. You will come back yeah. humbled. Bro. Yeah. I, I have an eight year old daughter who thinks everything I say is full of shit. I'm like, okay, okay. Yeah. One of these days you're going to come back. Like you were right. <laughs> like, yeah, I know you can do anything you want. Like she wanted to be actor. I was like, go, I can yeah. show you. No, she wanted dad to get her jobs. Right. You know what I mean? That don't work. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not into that. Yeah, right. Really. I want I want you to just earn that. You know, yeah. like all these things that these kids don't realize like, man, entrepreneurship is one is like, she wanted to start her own business. Do it. Google it. YouTube it. Show me you want that because I'm not yeah. going to hand this to mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Like, why would I hand it to you? You're not going to appreciate it. You'll appreciate more of the sweat, blood, and tears like you were saying. That blood, sweat, and tears that you earn on your own, man, that's a, that's a fruit of labor. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And that's what people start to appreciate more. Yeah. yeah and it, I mean, perfect example is, I mean, since I've known you, I don't know how many business business that you've been through, but the whiskey, yep. right? The tobacco company, yep. the beard oil company, yep. the, you know, I mean, the barbershop, the barbershop. I mean, I've seen the barbershop go from, I mean, it's dude, it's odd. 
Clean cut, man. This is the only place I'll go to. You know, are you doing those gay ass uh, yellow tips on his head? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, we don't, don't do color at the barbershop. We don't do that. I think that was at your hair salon, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, man, look, listen, this is the sun from the boat. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I, I don't mean gay as a derogatory thing. I just think it looks extremely metro, or you know, <laughs> goes with my tight sleeves, man. Yeah, he doesn't. Ha- he doesn't have the natural frost, man. Yeah, I right? know, right? Oh shit, that's but, so but, funny. But yeah, I've seen you know being being close friends with Vince over the years i mean i've i've seen time after time after time starting the new business and the struggles yeah. and the things that go oh, into man. all of it yeah. and you know i mean honestly huge props to you man Thank i mean you. you've always you're an you're an inspiration to me as especially as an entrepreneur Appreciate um that. because i've seen all the work and i've seen everything that that comes with trying to build even just a brand you know yeah. a name and the struggles you yeah. know i mean a handful of years ago i remember even with the uh, we were talking about the whiskey yeah and trying to get it into the stores and trying to get the licensing and you know, and watching you guys just deal, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm just going to come up with an idea and run with it. And you hit all the red tape yeah. and all the other struggles yeah. and things that. So that many that. layers, so, right, yeah. to business that we offer. You know, I for a long time, I was, I screwed myself in taxes because it's something I didn't think was a thing, yeah. right? Like in taxes, I was like, man, we're making this money. We're doing this. We're doing all the right things. And all of a sudden the tax bill, and you're like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I got to do that too. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then you have to hire the right, you know, yep. CPA to kind of keep t- tabs and check. And then you're like, oh man, so many levels to business that you can screw yourself so fast if you don't understand it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so you know, it's been, it's been a learning curve. I've lost a lot more. Like I said, like we've talked about, I've lost a lot more than I've won, but I'm starting to see light at the end of the tunnel for yep. every single business now, right? Yep. We're starting to kind of fine tune them and they're all kind of feeding themselves. And so it's, it's been a, it's been a hustle, man. And that's, yeah. Probably why I like it so much is the how hard it is and how fun it is to kind of combat that, right? Oh, and dude, just to get that reward yeah. that you know you earned yeah. and, and, and you create you created that. You created the whole thing and you got a reward out of it. See, that's yeah. that's what I told myself when I left the hair industry. You know, uh, we were, well, we, I, I had built a school. Yeah. Uh, it was damn near impossible to get the accreditation. We ended up teaming up with a company who was, kind of failing at the time but they had the accreditation so we you know joined Beautiful. forces and and uh, we were able to change a ton of lives from that graduate hundreds of students which was my main, my main goal i wasn't driven by money at that point because i was chasing money in my previous company yeah. uh and uh i saw where that got me and so i i wanted to have something more, with more of a purpose yeah you know and, and and we did that and i loved it but when i left that business i was like well you know the accreditation was never really mine you know my name was never really on the accreditation which it, and it couldn't be um, and so I'm like, I'm going to build something from scratch that can provide the same type of lifestyle yeah. that could bring in the same amount of money with my name on it, you know? And, uh, I wanted to do it in a really fast, like pace of time. And, uh, we, we did it. And two years later, mm-hmm. you know, I've only been in real estate for two years and, uh, we built a business, you know, in, yeah. in, in 18 months, we built a business, built a company. We're providing an awesome lifestyle for our agents. The ones who are actually taking advantage of it and crushing it, they're making more than 50,000 a month, Yeah, you know, which is an enormous amount of money yeah. for a lot of people. That's tons. You know, and uh, I fucking love it. And I love watching it. And I love seeing the, you know, the, the, the numbers and the boards and <clears throat> knowing those people personally, where they came from, watching them struggle when they struggle, watching them not make money when they don't make money. And then to see them make money now, it's so fucking rewarding, you know, because yeah. you yeah. see the struggle, yeah. you know, and, and for Alan and I, you know, we, we don't have any loans. Yep. We don't have any debt. You know, we've been, been, been able to cash flow this thing from our own pocket and then now get it to the point where it's profitable. And it's, dude, that feeling is fucking amazing. Yeah. Dude, it feels so good. You know, it's yeah. fucking yeah. amazing. It's everything. Yeah. So I think that's one of the, the joys of being an entrepreneur is to know that you can build something from scratch, make some real money from it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, just enjoy that journey. Yeah. You know? There's because a lot of people, a lot of people that ask like, like, how did you get to that point? And I was like, a lot of little things, right? Yeah. A lot of little things kind of got there. You know, I, I started my podcast, but it's like, I started my podcast in my house and then I had no sponsors. And then you started showing that you could put some numbers on the board and then you get a sponsor. And then from one sponsor gets another sponsor. So now I have an office and I built out the podcast. You know what I mean? Like it started from a slow burning idea mm-hmm. and is now turned into 
something that is just super success well successful enough where I'm pr- super proud of it. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's that's a fruit of labor, right? That's a hard work. That's a, that's putting pen to paper and and then actually having actions and doing that, right? There's a lot of people that we know that say, "Man, I want to start this business. Man, I want to do this. You know, hey, I want to do this." And then you're like, well, "Fucking do it, then, dude!" Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. start taking strides in that direction, right? Start making those steps because a lot of entrepreneurs sit on the idea on pen and paper and never do anything with that. You know yeah. what I mean? You guys have made actions, right? You get actions towards that goal, and here we are. You know yeah. what I mean? That's that's dope, man. Yeah, our, our last studio was in the other building we were in. And it was in my office that I turned into my office and Daniel's office, our videographer. And then I, t- I was like, hey, let's just put some mics in here and make a podcast. And, yep. then, you know, we, we were going around. I think it was like in uh, September, October. We were doing like this uh, uh, exercise. I was doing an exercise with my team and I had them put on these like ponchos. They were like paper ponchos. And I had them all write uh, their goals in the front. Yeah. And then I had everybody like write like positive things about them on the back. And uh I had my poncho still. I don't know where the fuck it's at right now. I think we, I lost it in the move. But on my poncho, everyone had their goals like, oh, I want to do 10 deals by the end of the year, 20 deals or 30 deals by the end of the year. And on mine, I said, I want to have my fucking podcast up and running and first episode done by December. And I put it on there. And I think we got the first episode up right before we, we filmed it right, right, in, right in December, right? Yeah. November, December. There you go. And I was like, got it. Like, we yeah. fucking did it. <laughs> Write it down. Even like m- getting the money for all the equipment. I didn't yeah. realize how much the, the equipment was. Yeah. You know, and we had guests, so we had three mics, three stands. We went through a few of those uh, audio mixer deals. Like yeah, we, switchers. And yeah, we fucking spilt water, coffee on it multiple <laughs> times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the computer couldn't process and, like, you know, it just edited everything. Well, yeah, that week we lost long. everything. We lost the computer, the mixer, everything. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, and so I'm like, damn, man, like, this is an investment. You got to actually invest yeah. in this shit. You can't just throw it together if you want to do it the right way, you know, yeah. and, and we did it the right way, and, and now here we are seven months later, and we got this studio, you know, <laughs> and I'm just like, hell yeah, like, what's next, you know? But <laughs> next, uh, next is going to be Joe Rogan. You know <laughs> <what I mean? laughs> That'd be awesome, dude. That'd be awesome. But, but no, uh, dude, uh, I am, uh, uh, I want to learn more about some of the businesses that you have uh, that you have right now yeah. that you're currently operating. Uh, you've talked to me about some of the stuff that you've done in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, I told you actually, I saw you at the airport, which was years yeah. ago. And it's pretty funny. Cause yeah. I, I recognize yeah, yeah, yeah. him. I saw him at the airport. I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we won't talk about what, you, what you're wearing, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, no, dude, I'm, 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 I'm happy you're here. I do want to get a little bit more insight on you yeah. know, your businesses, how you started them. We just had one of our last podcasts was the, the owner and the founder of uh, Five Wise Vodka. We've been in Utah here. Well, we started in Utah, started in Ogden, yeah. and we remain in Ogden. Oh, cool. Uh, Ogden's own uh, distillery. Yeah. Uh, he came on, and we talked about some of the challenges that you have when you're starting a liquor, liquor company and <laughs> dealing with the DABC and uh, all these weird-ass rules here in Utah. But he explained yeah. why they're like that, and I was like, oh, it makes well, sense. Well, Utah you know? makes it harder, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Right. But, I mean, so what is the alcohol company you, ha- you guys have? Yeah, right so, so I own Lead Slinger's Whiskey. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, let's, let's go from the beginning. I started with my friends doing YouTube videos and we did YouTube videos that were going viral, right? I jumped on board after the first two went viral and then they were trying to thinking what to do with that and how to kind of capitalize on it and how to make money from it. So we can got, kind of buy better cameras to do more, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I jumped on board because me and so if you guys might know a guy named Matt Best, he's part of the whole Black Rifle Coffee crew. And so okay. we'll kind of talk about how this all kind of came to fruition. We went to Iraq and Afghanistan together. We're in the same unit. Um, and so he hits me up. He was going to be in, in El Paso. And he's like, hey, man, I'd love to kind of hang out. You know, and so we drank some beers and bullshit. And he goes, you should help me with my company. We got a video. We got a film. I was like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm down to do whatever. And so we did a video and boom, it went viral, right? And we're like, holy shit. Like, I'm talking, when I say viral, you could probably go on YouTube right now and find it's like 8 million views, right? And so that's like, that's pretty dope, you know? And so in the back end of every video is marketing a t shirt company. We still own a company called Article 15 Clothing, which is gone and done now. It just doesn't, it's not even existing. But Article 15 Clothing was kind of military humored shirts. And so think about like kind of derogatory military humor is kind of the market we were kind of catering to these young veterans who just like stupid, funny shirts. And so as this kind of grew, Within one year, it was a $1.5 million company. And we were like, holy fuck. And we knew nothing about business. It was just like, oh, generate a viral video, market some shirts at the end, and see what happens. And so in, in sales, it's it's not a successful business model, as we learned later down the road. But we had spikes, man. We'd have $100,000 sold in, in, a, in a weekend. 
and then nothing until the next video comes out. You know, so this became pretty exhausting. And the first year we were 1.5, second year we were 2 point something, right? Uh, and, and there's a lot of money happening. And so what do you do with all this money that, that we don't go and fuck it up, you know? And so we were promoting a lot of drinking at the time. And, and, and there's a lot to this, that, that so many more levels to that, that why I kind of shifted my gears into a different direction. But we were promoting um, Jameson, you know, because in the military, sh- a shit ton of us drank it, you know? And so it was kind of this funny thing like, uh, oh, Jameson, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we we're like, man, let's reach out to Jameson and see if they're interested in even partnering with us because our videos are hitting millions of views, right? It, it makes sense. They ignored us. And we we're like, oh, fuck it. Let's start reaching out to whiskey companies and buy mm-hmm. one. And so we bought one. We bought one that was kind of doing its own little thing. It's kind of a small distillery. And now, you know, we've built a second distillery and, and also a brewery and, and we're in more Oklahoma and we're in 40 something states, you know? And it wasn't easy, right? It wasn't easy because... From these videos became, we had to really learn business. And then from from the t-shirt company, the whiskey company, we started doing coffee. And then they ventured off and did Black Rifle Coffee. I ventured off and started doing my own thing. But we created this big monster of a marketing platform that was able to drive traffic and created a movie that essentially was a marketing uh, film about our whiskey. And so it all started from a YouTube video till, till then. And so after that, I've kind of ventured off and I jumped into, you know, a company called Warfighter Tobacco. It's a cigar company. And then I jumped into a beard product company that eventually came into my, my barber shop. And so kind of everything's kind of branching off from one thing to another. Um, and yeah, man, it's, it hasn't been easy. It's been a little bit of a challenge. And, you know, I think I, I kind of enjoy those, those little struggles because, uh, I want to find a win, right? I want to be successful. And so I love the challenge of, you know, trying to find a way. And so right now, you know, the whiskey is uh, kind of on autopilot. It's doing its thing. I'd love for it to get in a position where we can sell it for tons and tons of money. You know what I mean? And then I can go around and and put money into another business and try and make that successful, you know? And so part of it is the chase of of making successful businesses, you know? And so, you know, that's where it started. And that's where we're at now. And I own, you know, my, you know, and another company called Veteran and stuff like that. And that's really kind of a veteran push. But yeah, so it started, that's how we got the whiskey. It was having enough money to, to buy into someone else's and then kind of working from there. Nice. So are you guys, do you guys have the capacity to take on like private label jobs? Yeah, we can, you know, if it makes sense, you know what yeah. I mean? But like I said, for everyone, like we, we were talking about before is you want to own an alcohol company, you better have a marketing strategy. Yeah. Right? This, this is what, this is what he talked to us about, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, our last guest uh, was he was he saying the same? Yeah, yeah. He yeah. Was, he, so so he doesn't offer private label stuff, and, and he was thinking about doing it, but he said that the problem with that is people think that oh, just because you can start an t- alcohol company, yeah. it's going to sell itself, and it doesn't. Yeah, you have it to does. have an enormous budget for, it for yeah. marketing. You have to have the marketing yeah. budget, and the marketing budget has to be you're competing with everyone. You know what I mean? And look, we competed with we, our whiskey got so popular at one point in Tennessee that some bigger companies I won't name them actually contacted distributors and said, if you start carrying them, you'll lose us. It's an ugly fight. You know what I mean? It becomes really weird space, you know? And so just remember that you can ruffle feathers and, and uh, it's not, it's, you know, they have so much money that they can bury you in law in in legal bull crap. Mm -hmm. So you gotta, you gotta be willing to play that game. You know what I mean? And so we were willing to do our marketing in the way that we did it and generate the, the attention for it. Some people hate the whiskey. Some people love the whiskey. It's, that's kind of one of those acquired taste kind of things. And, yeah. you know, in the end of the day, those are, those are veterans who own that company. And, and, and it's a kind of a beautiful story of being a veteran entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. We talked about that a little bit, about the whole alcohol taste and... Mm-hmm. I mean, let's be honest. Alcohol tastes like shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah, alcohol is alcohol. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it's it's really it's a it's a psychological ethanol. You know, yeah, it's a psychological um, impact that each brand will provide, and it's based on yeah. marketing, right? You can put Patron in a, in a bottle and say it's a it's a top shelf. You can put Patron in a bottle and put it in the bottom shelf. It doesn't matter. In the end of the day, they asked you as a, as a as as the company, where do you want this price at, and 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 who do you want to compete against? Yeah, you know what I mean, like. We established that early on, like we want to be a, a an affordable bottle, and as well as we want to compete with just the basic, you know, you know, basic whiskey companies. Yeah, Jack Daniels. Yeah, Jack like Daniels, and, yeah. and you know, and and man, in the end of the day, I I can't stand the way Jack Daniels tastes, yeah. but I'll drink the motherfucker, right? Yeah. Like I'm sober now, but I would have, I would have drank it, you know, yeah. I would have drank Makers, I would have drank it, I didn't care. It was like just put it in a bottle, let's put it in a cup, and let's go. Yeah. 
And so, you know, why couldn't we fit in that space? And we did. And now we're there, right? Now we can compete with any of them. And, you know, they're obviously a bigger brand, but, you know, we have less overhead than them. And like I said, we're, we're, we're successful. Yeah. So it's, it's a kind of a cool thing. And it's really weird being sober now and owning that company too. Yeah, you no, know, I, I can only imagine. Very strange. Yeah. I don't market it. I, I can't push it on my... I don't feel right. Like it's kind of like this this ethical question, right? Like this ethical kind of positioning. I don't feel right promoting alcohol when I'm sober. So I don't touch it. And that's a weird space to be, you know. But, you know, the company's still going to do its thing. And, you know, I could always hire people to market it for me. We have a company here in Utah that's that's doing photos and stuff like that for us right now. And, you know, it is what it is. Can we pick it up at the local uh, alcohol? The I don't know. We've been fighting with store? Utah for a while. For a long time, it was in the state liquor store. It might not be right now. Um but that's one of those ones that Utah is just tough. But, yeah, almost every other state you can. I'm talking California, Arizona, Texas. I mean, anything you can think of, there's very few, there's a few small pockets in the East Coast that don't have us, but everyone else pretty much does. Mm. Yeah, Lead Slinger's Whiskey. You got to go check it out. Just remember, it's, it's owned by veterans, man. We, we do our thing and try, and try and keep it going. You know, like I said, I love the position in a way where, where one of the big dogs wants to buy us out, and so I can turn around and do a different business. But, yeah. but you know, that's just one of the businesses that's doing well. Our, our cigars are doing freaking awesome. Like cigar world, it took a while. Like the cigar world thought we were, we were going to be out of business in two years. And every time we showed up to a cigar convention, they're like, "Oh, you're still here." Like, yeah, yeah, you're fucking right. We are, dog. We're a bunch of fighters, homie. You know what I mean? The cigar world is a very interesting one because uh, you you do fight with a lot of the taxes that are you know they 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 blanket cigars in with cigarettes, which is not right to do. I think it's kind of unfair. Cigarettes tend to market towards 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 20 year olds. That's not fair either, but that, that's their world, not mine. Cigars are kind of this acquired taste. It's like a scotch, right? It's like yeah. the scotch of the, of the tobacco world. It's a, an acquired taste. It's kind of a, a more mature audience that okay. smokes a cigar and appreciates a cigar. So when they blank us in that, it really screws us on taxes. And so that's what kills us in the end of the day in, in the funding side of it. You have to have the money to fight with that. But cigars is dope, man, because yeah. once you get into that world, you know, they didn't want us in that world. You show up to a cigar convention, everyone's wearing these, you know, these 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 nice shirts and these very classy, you know. <laughs> you know? And then you got a bunch They're of... They're walking around with their scars. Bro, yeah. And you got a bunch of combat veterans with beards and like <laughs> shaggy ass fucking camo shirts. And we're like, what's up, dude? But we knew we had a niche. We knew there was a void in the space for us because my first cigar was in Iraq. You know what I mean? I, my buddies were like, here, man, I have a cigar. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I inhaled that shit. Oh. I'm like, damn, that <laughs> burns, bro. And I don't, I'm not a smoker, dude. So I was like, that was fucked up. And they're like, no, bro, just puff on that thing. You know? And so I learned my first cigar and that memory will stick with me forever, dude. Yeah. Sitting there with a bunch of dudes. We just gone on mission and, you know, you just kind of like man time. You know what I mean? It was a very beautiful time. And, I posted once and over, man, 200 veterans were like, you know what? My first cigar was in Iraq too. Mine was in Afghanistan. Mine was this. Mine was this. And like these things, like there is a space for us in here, but yeah. you know, and so that's where ours now is definitely turning a profit, doing very well. We're just really in a position where we're happy. We're, we're making new blends and, and that is a really cool space to be in because, you know, look, I, I don't smoke as many cigars as I, as I, as I wish I did because I don't have the time to, but when uh -huh. I have the, the, the time to, it always brings back that, yeah, man, this is cool. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a time thing, right? Yeah, I look at it like meditation. Yeah, you know, and and I've always looked at it that way. And I'm a cigar smoker, yeah. but I probably smoke one cigar every month and a half. I mean, I'm in, the, I'm in yeah. the same yeah, time. It's frame. not like yeah. you're smoking it every day. You no, know I mean? not at all, dude. No, it's like it's like if if I have a a win, a victory, if I hit a goal, I will reward myself, yeah. and I'll go sit either in the back parking lot or I'll go you know, somewhere and, yeah. and, and do it. You know what I mean? And it's, again, if I do it alone, I'm happy. If I do it with somebody, I'm happy. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's right, it, for it, hanging yeah. out the top of a limo. <laughs> oh, smoking this girl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I wish I could have hit it in there, but Ceci came with us and she's pregnant, so I'm not smoking yeah. that thing. I did one at a golf, on a golf tournament, right? And I put it out right away. I was like, no, nah, no, nah, dude, I can't even enjoy it. Because yeah. every time I got to sit here and swing, I got to put it down. Like, nah. it down. Yeah. I like yeah. that moment of just, you know, taking that 45 minutes to, to yeah. myself and smoking and kind of just, you know, it's yeah. it's a cool thing, and and, and and the one thing about the cigars too is, and I'm not, I apologize yeah. to cut you off, but like, yeah, I learned like when it comes down to cigars, I actually didn't even have my first one until what, like with you, about yeah. a year and a half ago. Or so yeah. I never liked it, you know, I, got, I never got it, I never got into smoking or anything like that. And I'm like, why the fuck would I, you know, smoke a cigar? They taste like shit, you know. I, yeah. I, I I didn't get it, but then after he explained to me, you know, we sat down, you know, I think we were in Vegas at that time, yeah. right, at Monte Cristo. Yeah, Monte Cristo. Nice, nice. Uh, so nice. We got some nice. We went there like, like a one in the morning, bro. <laughs> yeah. We had a long weekend, and we worked our ass off getting ourselves to the point to where 
we had money in our account and we never ever used our business card for anything personal. Nice. And I think the first thing we bought was some bottles of it was water. At a gas station. Yeah, some bottles of water and like uh, I don't know, some maybe some jerky or something. Yeah, yeah, and we're and we're driving to Vegas. And I'm like, this is our first purchase with our business. Like yeah. this is fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, man. nice. You know, and, and I was like, dude, we gotta stop and enjoy a cigar. Yeah. Buy some cigars. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, we went to Vegas, we hit Monte Cristo, and I'm like, bro, just look at the scene. Yeah. And it's like all these, you know, top producing people in Monte Cristo. Yeah. And uh, the, just the whole, this is the whole experience of how to cut the cigar, how to light the cigar. Everything. They light it for you. They sit you down in this little booth, you know, and we sat there and we just sat and talked. And it was fucking cool. Yeah. It's, 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 it was actually my first time truly enjoying one, you know, for a good 30 to 45 minutes yeah. or so. Um, but when you talk about, you know, meditation, it's literally a form of med- 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 meditation where you just feel so, you forget about everything else that's going on in the world, all the chaos, all the, you know, everything, and you're just able to focus right there in that moment and be 100% present. Man, like, after that day, I'm like, well, I don't mind. I'll have one here. Yeah, there. you like, get it. Uh, you I, get I, it. I get it. But yeah. prior to yeah. then, dude, I'm 30 years old. First time I had, like, a, a cigar, was, I was like, what, 28, 29 yeah. probably? Yeah, my wife didn't understand it at first. And I then, didn't get it. And then she, she's like, ah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, she yeah. likes seeing me with my veteran buddies BSing. Yeah. yeah, and enjoying it, and she goes, "I get it. Yeah, you go have a cigar with your friends, whatever. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's this cool thing. Uh, so that that is my thing. I don't drink. I do smoke a cigar once in a while, and when I do, it's like it's it's mine. It's my time. Mm-hmm. You know. And so I've been very proud of that business and where it's going and, and how it's doing. And the, and the guys who run it, my two buddies who who run it day to day, are just hustlers out of San Antonio. So if you guys are in San Antonio, Texas, there's an actual. You can go to Warfighter Tobacco and smoke one with the guys and tell them war stories and everything else. Uh, we have a lot of law enforcement and, and military that support it because it's kind of the, the that's the world that we fit into in the, in the scar space. And so you guys, anyone listening, and go to warfightertobacco.com and check them out. And it really is a cool company. That's pretty dope, yeah. dude. You know, I look at him and I'm like, how the fuck did you get in the military with all those tattoos? It must have came after. Yeah, well, a lot of them came after. Okay, I, yeah, I had, because I wanted to sign up. My boys and I went yeah. to the recruiting center and we checked out all four of them. And I wanted the Marines because my family, I got Marines in the family. Yeah. My grandfather's a Marine. My great-grandfather's a Marine. And I'm like, okay, I'm doing the Marines, you know. And I was a fucking idiot as a kid. And and I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And yeah. my dad, you know, he was in jail and stuff yeah. like that. So I didn't have a father figure to kind of guide me and raise me. And I'm like, okay, the military is what I need. Yeah. So I went to the military. I went to sign up at, at the uh, Marine Recruiting Center. And they're like, oh, you got a tattoo in the back of your neck. like, yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, so what? <laughs> Everyone's blasted. They're like, well, there's no tattoos allowed below the the yeah the it all depends on the time you got in time yeah, you tried this is like 2005 six yeah there. it's wartime and i'm like oh shit like, know, i'm gonna bro. go in right and so they're like he's like look we're gonna try to get you in and we're gonna see if we can get you a waiver right because you're a good candidate you'll fit and i said cool and so i'm doing all the pt with them i do the asvab and i take my physical and we had a date i was planning to go to boot camp and and uh my boys went and i couldn't go because the day that it was like two weeks before we were supposed to go. My, the gunnery sergeant said, dude, your waiver got denied. You can't go in. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, how stupid is that? Yeah. Like, this is not even a gang tattoo, right? This is a bunch of stars. Like, I fuck know. it, you know? And, and he's like, Here, here's what we'll do. We, I, I'll give you two options. Option one, I'll pay half for you to get it removed. I said, cool. Let me go to the, the dermatologist, laser, laser place, get it taken off. I go in. She's like, yeah, the black's going to come off in one, se- one session. The red is a hard pigment. It's going to take six sessions. And I'm like, okay, can I do it all in one day? She's like, no, the sessions are like a month and a half in between. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, forever. this is like a nine month process. And she's like, yeah, I go tell the gunnery sergeant, what's option two? He's like, option two is I give you morphine. We belt sand it off. I'm like, fuck <laughs> you. <laughs> That's dope. <laughs> He's like, give you morphine. We belt sand it off. And if there's some scarring there, I can have someone tattoo the same color of your skin. And I'm like, but then I'm going to go to like boot camp all fucked up. And he's like, you'll be fine. I'm like, Nah, I'm not doing that yeah. shit, bro. <laughs> so I couldn't go, right? I was in when they changed all this shit. Yeah. I had already, I had had tattoos from when I first went in the military. And then all of a sudden they came out with all these regulations. Yeah. And I almost, I almost got kicked out every other month. Did someone see the tattoo on bro. the back of my neck or on my wrist or whatever? And yeah. trying to throw me out. And it got, yeah. yeah. I got to it got point. weird for a minute, man. Yeah. It got it got real weird, especially in the Air Force, which was yeah. well, the Air Force was more strict on it. Was that, oh yeah, they were yeah. they were way strict on it. I yeah. mean, they were sending me to doctors, and at the time when when it became an issue with me when I was in, it wasn't like you just drive the street and go get a laser. I mean, the tattoo removal yeah. wasn't like it was now, yeah. where it's actually it takes time, but it's easy to do, right? Yeah. So yeah, it was it was nonstop. It was constantly in the commander's office and having to show everybody, and then go. You know, I, I think the the four bases that I was at each time I went there. 
I had to deal with this yep. with, with this shit all over again because the you know the um God not the supervisors at you know the prior base we had gone through the whole thing and basically the doctors on base were like we don't have lasers man what do we we can't just yeah. send me up the street to do it they'd give me a waiver and leave me alone and I turn uh. PCS somewhere else and have to deal with the shit all over again yeah. so yeah yeah I started I had a the left arm and the right arm just kind of sleeve but like early stages of a start of a sleeve yeah. they had to get waivers on that and then uh, as I got in. In, when you get in Ranger Battalion, there's like special operations. It's kind of like, I don't really give a yeah, shit. So, I, so, yeah. so I got fully sleeved out. Um, and then I got out of active duty, went reserve. And in the reserves, I, by then I'm an E6 and everyone kind of respects me. Yeah. You know, So I went and got my hands blasted and no one said shit. I was like, oh, fuck. Well, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. And I was a federal agent at the time, too. Is I, I, I went to the union and said, can I get my hands tattooed? And they said, yeah. Um, because the tattoo policy at the time was like, well, there's nothing really that says anything about hands, so I guess. And I was like, cool, I'm getting them done. Boom, got my hands tattooed. So I'm a federal agent with hands blasted and in the military. That's what's up. Yeah, and people were like, are you allowed to have this? I was like, I don't know. No one's ever said anything. (laughs) And so I'm teaching classes of like 400 soldiers, and I'm and the sergeant major coming up to me. I'm like, oh, crap, he's going to say anything. He goes, hey, Vargas, nice tattoos, man. Keep going. Good job. And I'm like, Right as our major, and yeah. so like no one questioned it. I kind of showed up like like I own the place, you know, like whatever. And uh, you know, I had some issues in the in the federal agency side of things, of people just kind of thought it was unprofessional. But I was in the special operations there as well, and I'm doing missions all day. I'm wearing gloves anyway, so like no one ever sees it besides when travel. So it was like no one questioned it. So I didn't get my neck blasted, and so after that, it's like who cares, you know? And I didn't. It wasn't going to affect me because I was already a federal agent, already doing this for for however many years, and so. I found my place in life, and so I was like, well, we'll just keep getting tattooed until they tell me I can't, you know, because tattoos is a different culture for me. My father's been tattooed his whole life. My first tattoo convention was when I was 10 years old. You know what I mean? Like, this is something that's just in our family. Yeah. I came back from Iraq. We got blasted. I came back from Afghanistan. We got blasted. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of my tattoos are part of my cultural space, my, my family, you know? Yeah. And so I just kept getting them done. Now it's slowing me down a ton because of acting. Like, not everyone wants to hire me because of the tattoos in the, in the Hollywood space. It's not really... You know, you don't see a cop with tattoos. Well, you do, but not in Hollywood, right? Not uh, so much. You know, they see me as the bad guy. It helped me a lot getting my ends, but I think it's it really slowed me down in getting other roles. Yeah, yeah. So, so how did you get the my ends role? How did that come about? I mean, did they see your profile? Did uh, no, you? I mean, did you hit it, your age enough? I mean, how the hell? No, did that I didn't happen? have an agent. I haven't had. I didn't have an agent for a while. Um, you know, it was the path I took was I produced a movie and I used that as my, kind of my my reel. I started producing it. I produced another short film about um, mental health and, and, and struggling with transition. And so I started making films. These documentary films? Or no, these are just like short films. Okay. Short One's film. an actual full film and then a documentary. So yes, one is a full full feature length comedy. Then it's a documentary about how we produce that. And so it was kind of this telling the, telling the story. Mm-hmm. you know. And then I made a short film on, on transition, veteran transition. It was just kind of like my, I wanted to make something for my, my brothers and sisters. Uh, and so that was kind of my acting real demo real is it yeah. w- what I needed. And then I started doing these improv comedy things called dads and parks. And so I used that as well. And s- filming my second round of dads and parks with my buddy in LA, I was in LA at the right time at the right place. You know what I mean? Um, somebody called me and said, Hey, Mayans is still looking for guys. Do you want me to send your name forward? And this is a friend. I'm like, uh, yeah, dude. He goes, send me your reel, send me your headshots, send us a quick bio. Don't forget to mention you're a veteran because it might help. I'm like, cool. Set my bio and everything else. By that night, I had sides in my in my email for me to read for one of the characters. I was like, well, here we go. First real Hollywood audition. Yeah. You know what I mean? Talk to my boy about, like, what should I expect? And he's like, just fucking go in there and kick ass, dude. Like, don't be worried. Just go in there. And so I went in there and did it, man. I, I did my, my read at, off paper, right? Like, yeah. completely memory. Hit it. And then uh, we went home. And me and my wife were like, well. We'll see what happens, you know. Yeah. On the flight home, we get an email saying, hey, we want to see you back here again. I was like, holy shit. And this is in front of Kurt Sutter, which is like the big dog. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit. Like, this is getting real. And me and my wife had the conversation like, do we really want to do this? Like, is yeah. this going to change our lives? Like, what, you know? And, she's, and you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, like that conversation. Yeah, like The insecurities come up. Yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah like, is, whoa, what are we getting into? You know what I mean? And at the time, my show over here in the History Channel is still happening, right? So that's going. And so... I don't know where my space is in entertainment or, or life. I walked away from a career as a federal agent. I'm kind of stuck in limbo. So I'm like, let's just go for it and see what yeah. happens. I flew back to LA, 
had to had to read for two different people now. So now I'm reading for a guy who's more serious and a guy who's kind of a, a funny, funny, reluctant type, you know, and hit them both. At the end, I, I swear to you, man, we kind of blacked out in the, like this laughter. And I was like, OK, I think I did pretty good because everyone in the room's laughing, shook their hands and just walked out of there. Uh, my dad was with me that time because my wife stayed home with the kids. And uh, he's jumping on my back and kind of like, man, that's cool. How did it go? And I was like, oh, I think it went well. And I guess Kurt Sutter was watching because the, the casting agent, she kind of told me later. She goes, dude, Kurt saw your dad jumping on your back and kind of hugging you. And he, he really appreciated that, that genuineness. Uh, you got the job. So that's I was like, holy crazy. fuck. Yeah, so that was it. Like five days later, I'm on set filming the first pilot of Mind's MC with no experience compared to what, just what I've done myself. Yeah. Acting like I've been there, and everyone in the room is like, Kurt's first meeting we had is all, all the cast members. He goes, I pride myself because you guys have more prison time than uh, screen time. And everyone's looking at me like, Yeah, man. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Bro, I've been in a correction a- corrections officer for two years and a federal agent, you know, catching drug smugglers for the past seven. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not that guy. Yeah. And so I felt uncomfortable because I didn't want them to think uh, I was something I wasn't. So we had a barbecue that night at Emilio Rivera's house, and I kind of told him, I was like, look, hey, just, just so you guys know, man, here's my true background. You want to get to know me, this is it. But at the time, I had more followers than any of them on social media. Yeah. They were like, who the fuck is this dude? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, here we go. You know, And it didn't take long for us to just kind of become brothers and on set. Yeah. And you know, now we're going on our fourth year of this, and you know, my character grows. You know, My character, Gilly, has turned into to a significant part of the show, and man, we're just kind of running with it still. Yeah. Yeah, that's fucking cool, man. That is so badass. You know, I think that I mean, the whole transition from being a you know a, a federal. I mean, you're you're a border patrol, right? Border patrol agent, man. Border yeah. patrol agent, and then now you're acting. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. a pretty extreme transition. Yeah, FX did a little uh, behind the scenes thing, you know, and it yeah. talked about how I am now playing the character that I used to chase. Yeah, exactly. That's so interesting. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, trust me. And you know, it's it's part of as an actor, so you get your character and you kind of fight, kind of dissect that character and you really want to get down to the nuts and bolts of what makes this person tick. That's how I can create uh make a character be real. I have yeah. to really understand what makes them tick. And it wasn't hard, man. I was like, Psh, I know this guy. I know Gilly. Gilly's the guy I chased, you know. <laughs> Gilly's the guy that I had to kind of think I had to outthink him. You know what I mean? And so I'm on this side of it as a law enforcement officer trying to outthink a drug smuggler and how he's going to get his drugs across, you know, and, and it's this cat and mouse game that we play in real life that I have to kind of, you know, harness as yeah. the actor now playing that guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's badass. Dude, that'll, that'll That's be, badass. I feel like that'll be fun though. That'd be fun to do. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's incredible. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, dude. Come on, man. I'm, 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 I'm playing yeah. a bad guy. That's, That's fun. fucking amazing, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah I, I don't like to tell my wife that like it's so fun because then it's like it's not work and you know, then she complains like you're just at work and just having fun. Yep. So, you know what I mean? I so, that all the time. Yeah, yeah. Babe, so, all, all you do is to, you know, just talk and all this. I'm like, babe, I'm actually working. This is work. Yeah. Because <laughs> when, you, when you love it so much, it doesn't feel like work. Exactly. Exactly, and so I try not to come home with too too big of a smile. <laughs> yeah. like, man, I had I had a yeah. rough day. Yeah, I was like, ah, man, oh, it was tough. I hate it. <laughs> and then I, and then I, and then I have her over here. So I've, I've been cutting hair all day. Mm-hmm. I'm seven months pregnant. How do you think I feel? And I'm like, oh shit, I should probably shut up right That's now. That's exactly. Yeah, stop talking. Yeah, about the funny all thing all is, like, so I went, is. I went, I went, I went golfing with this this incredible doctor who 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 struggled with addiction and got his license back. It's just an incredible story, right? And he goes, hey. You ever tell your wife you have a bad day on the golf course? I said, yeah, yeah all the time. He goes, well, fucking stop that. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, every time you come home, you tell her you had the best day of your life. She's not going to complain that you go golf because she likes that you come home in a good mood. She goes, but if you come home every day complaining that you had a shitty day on the golf course, she's like, well, then why waste four hours of my fucking time? For you to come home in a bad mood too. And I was like, man, that's the best information I've ever got from an old man. And I'm like, I come home now, I, I golf terrible. I come home, I was like, man, that was the best. Yeah. I needed that relaxation. Thank you. <laughs> Little tricks of the that, trade, man. The credit, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that's fucking comedy. Well, dude, I gotta tell you, I'm so happy that you came in. I'm really happy to meet you, bro. Um, yeah. Uh, I feel like we'll be doing this quite a bit, you know, especially yeah. here in, in, in any time, man. Anytime. Yeah, I know we had Lake. a lot of information and we, we could talk for hours, man, yeah. but it, it felt like it just went by so fast, but I appreciate it, man. You, yeah. you let me know I'm in town and, and I'll come back on here anytime. Yeah. Uh, I definitely want to get some more uh, information on the whole Mayans thing. Yeah. Bro. I, think, I think I can play a bad guy in there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Hey man. <laughs> 
mean, oh, if shit. you want to get killed real quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Put me in for 10 seconds. That's all I want. <laughs> as long as your suit looks good. Yeah, hair, yeah right? there we go. Yeah, there I, we audition, go. I auditioned for uh, Yellowstone, and then I was like, no, nah, I didn't want any of those roles because it's all getting killed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, you would have been one of those bikers that lasts yeah. like 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Dig your own hole. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fucking cool. No, dude, let's give you some plugs before you go. Uh, your company in the whiskey company is. Yeah, I, I own Let's Singers Whiskey. You guys could check them out pretty much anywhere. You could just Google it and they'll tell you where it's at. Uh, WarfighterTobacco.com. You can order cigars directly to your house from there, unless you're in Utah. Uh, I have a, if you're local to Utah, we have Throwbacks Barber Company off of Redwood Road and pretty much 90th. And um, yeah, Veteran.com, man. That's just a, it's kind of my, my veteran company that we're trying to. That's going to be funding our nonprofit, which is going to be building, you know, uh, recreation centers for veterans. And so my goal is to, to create a safe space for veterans to, to, to find community, to find themselves again and find all the resources they need to kick ass in society, dude. And so that's my goal. That's my job. And if you guys are veterans listening to this and you want to hear more, you, you have any kind of questions, man, hit me up on any social media platform. I answer every single email that comes through. Uh, I'm here for you. And uh, anything else you guys need, man, just let me know. Awesome. Awesome. And do you guys have a website for uh, veterans? Yeah, better, veteran.com. Veteran. Yeah, yeah veteran.com. Okay. It's veteran with a B. It's take that V off and put a B. You know, And, and that's yeah. a positive mindset, right? Yeah. Like, I'm just trying to push that all day long. Like, we like can be that. better, man. We could do more. You know, this is kind of why me and Billy are, are friends and why we continue to push that for other veterans and help them uh, find normalcy again. Awesome. Well, dude, thank you again for being here. Alan, yeah, thank dude. you for being here today. Thank you. Uh, Billy, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, let's definitely chat about what we talked about earlier, which is the program we want to come out with, which yeah. is going to help veterans get into houses. Yeah. Uh, and working with agents to help contribute some of their commission and then working with somebody like Billy who will help uh, cover some of the costs that are associated with purchasing a house like the appraisal inspections and inspections yep, absolutely like that. Yep. Uh, and then we'll talk more about putting something together where we can help use your platform to get that out there yeah I'm um, in perfect okay awesome well thank you again guys thank you again Vince. thank you and, thank you uh, thank you guys